chapter 10, you'll read where Cornelius was a Roman centurion. Now the gospel is going to the Gentiles. This is after the stoning of Stephen. Peter goes to this house. It's the first time he's preaching to a Gentile. Cornelius is a centurion from the Italian band. What language do you think they spoke? Latin, Italian, right? He's got servants in his household. The servants in the Roman Empire were, could be from anywhere. They spoke other languages. Peter, who speaks Jewish now, is being invited by the servants in Cornelius' household to go and the angel said, Peter's going to come and he's going to teach to you. Peter begins to talk. They understand partially what he's saying. It's not their native tongue. While Peter is preaching about Jesus in Aramaic, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Verse, uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Those who were of the circumcision which believed were astonished because as many as came with Peter, the, the Jews who had come, were surprised that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost for they heard them speak with tongues. That means they understood them speaking with tongues and magnify God. That means they could understand what they were saying in those tongues. They were magnifying God. They weren't just babbling. Does that make sense? The same way the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 10 is the same gift that you find in Acts chapter 2. If you don't believe Pastor Doug, you read in verse 15, Peter, and this is chapter 11 of Acts, Acts chapter 11 verse 15, you might want to look that up. When Peter reports back to the council in Jerusalem how God is now sending the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles, listen to what Peter says. The Holy Ghost fell on them as it fell on us at the beginning. So what kind of gift of tongues do they get in Acts chapter 10? Something new? A new variety? Or is it the same kind of gift of tongues Peter says that we had at the beginning? Right? It's languages that could be understood. Then you've got the third example of speaking in tongues that you're going to find in uh, Acts chapter 19. This also is a place where it talks about uh, rebaptism. The twelve Ephesian disciples. We all know that Jesus had twelve Jewish disciples, do you know after the gospel went to the Gentiles, you find a story where there's 12 Gentile disciples. Acts 19, Paul preaches to these uh, 12 Ephesians who were baptized by John the Baptist. They had not heard the story about Jesus yet. He preaches to them about Jesus. He lays hands upon them. I'm in Acts 19 verse 6. The Holy Ghost came on them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now what does prophesied mean? means they preached. Prophesied doesn't mean you walk around giving uh, astrological fortune cookies. Uh, prophesied means that you preach. And so could they understand what they were saying in these tongues? Yeah, it says they were prophesying. They were preaching. Were there different language groups present? You've got Paul, you've got Luke, you've got Ephesians. So there's several language groups that are present there. They needed the gift of tongues. They recognized there was a difference of tongues. The very fact that Luke doesn't say the Holy Spirit fell on them a whole different way. They got a different kind of gift of tongues. He doesn't say that. Which means it's the same kind of gift of tongues that you saw in Acts chapter 10 and that you saw in Acts chapter 2. There you have it friends. We've looked at all of the examples of speaking in tongues in the Bible. And nowhere do you see an example of this incoherent muttering and babbling where the person speaking may not even know what they're saying there is a counterfeit that has been introduced. For every truth of God, for every truth of God, Satan has a counterfeit. Is there counterfeit love? Is there a counterfeit for uh, the Holy Spirit? You can bet there is. Does God have a counterfeit law? Counterfeit Sabbath? He's got counterfeits, uh, the, the devil I mean. The devil's got a counterfeit for every truth of God. Shouldn't surprise us that he not only has a counterfeit for tongues. There's a true gift of tongues. I want to reiterate, I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in miracles. I believe in healing. I believe in casting out devils. I believe in prophecy. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. But there's been a, a, a cuckoo bird egg that's been laid in the church. That is not the gift of tongues. And it has confused a lot of people. And you know what breaks my heart? While I was studying and preparing for this last night... I read the testimony of one young lady who said, I have become an atheist because I grew up in a church where they did the most bizarre things and she was referring to this 
common practice of babbling incoherently, the out of control behavior. And she said, I just couldn't believe that that was God. And so she's given herself to atheism, young lady. A lot of people have been turned away from Christianity because God says, come now, let us reason together. God is not the author of confusion. The pandemonium and the bedlam and the cacophony of noise that's done in the name of the Lord. That's why here at Central we often make a big deal about reverence in worship. God is orderly. And I think that there ought to be respect. I like it when you say amen. That's good. And you're just saying we you know, agree. But there's communication. Now I'm going to get more into the process of that. But even by definition. Um, glossolalia. It comes from, this is this popular ecstatic utterance, the babbling that they call speaking in tongues. Um, it's a combination of two words, glossia, which means language and then to speak, or tongues and then to speak. According to the American Heritage Dictionary, it is fabricated and non-meaningful speech, especially such scene associated with a trance state or certain schizophrenic syndromes. That's not me. It's not my church. This is the American Heritage Dictionary. What is a language? According to the same dictionary, the language is the use by human beings of voice sounds, often written symbols representing these sounds, in organized combinations with patterns in order to express and communicate those thoughts and feelings. By any definition, the disjointed, repetitive uh, gibberish that you often hear is not a language. Matter of fact, I can't remember their names right now, but a couple of gentlemen wrote some books and have done some studies on this uh, phenomenon that is spread through the Protestant and Catholic churches of speaking in tongues where they recorded somebody speaking in tongues. And then they took this to linguists from a number of different countries, experts in studying languages and articulation. And they said, what language is this? And all of them came back with the same conclusion. They said, this couldn't be any language, earthly or otherwise, because most of it is rep repeating words and there is no sequence, no system to it that would communicate any kind of organized thought. It doesn't meet the definition of language. Now I have some quotes. That this is from the New York Times, a recent article dealing with the subject of tongues. Uh, the Catholics were quite worried a, a few years ago. An estimated 1.3 million Latino Catholics have given up the Roman Catholicism and embraced Pentecostalism since immigrating to the United States. Well, one way that, that they've compensated now, the Catholic churches are welcoming uh, speaking in tongues in their church. They find it doesn't really conflict with most of their doctrines and so they figure, you know, better join them than lose them. And so a number of Catholic churches are now charismatic churches. Um, go on to the next slide here. Someone who is speaking about this. Speaking in tongues is a controversial practice to many Christians, but others consider it a gift from God. Uh, continue. And many people who attend the Freedom Valley Worship Center in Gettysburg, this is one church that they picked out. Pray for that gift. This is in Gettysburg, uh, Pennsylvania. For me, it's almost as if I'm able to tap into God's heart and what He wants, said Amber Crone, a member of the church. I don't really know what I'm saying, but I know it's what God wants me to say and to speak. You can feel Him. I want you to notice the emphasis on feeling. You can feel Him all around you. You can feel Him speaking through the words that you are saying. Next, like Crone's friend, Kelly, describes what she says is a feeling of connection to God. I know some people get a warm, fuzzy feeling going on inside. For me, I get goosebumps. Actually, are goosebumps a feeling too? So much of it is not dealing with spiritual enlightenment of truth that sets you free. It's all actually very basic and carnal. And you might wonder, how did it find its way into the church? In virtually every pagan religion of the world, you find this dynamic. Uh, it can be traced back, for instance, to the Oracle of Delphi in Greece. And you know the Greeks had, had uh, conquered the then civilized world. That um, people would go to this place, and there's an actual picture of the ruins of the Oracle of Delphi. And the whole cult religion was developed around this. And the people weren't wanting a message from the gods, they would go and consult the Oracle. Have you heard that term before? 
And what would happen is they would go through, the priest would go through these incantations and there was a priestess there who was called a Sibyl or the um, 